Hello, wherever in the world you are. Good morning, afternoon or evening. Uh, I'm Danny Dresner, Professor of Cyber Security at the University of Manchester. Uh, and more than just a little bit thrilled to be able to welcome Emily Overton, the Records Management Girl, uh, who is extremely good at putting into practical terms uh, a lot of what our cybersecurity colleagues uh, talk about. Uh, so without trying to uh, recreate a meta version of the talk in the introduction, I think it's better that I hand straight over to Emily. We are going to have questions uh, at the end, uh, so if you could put those into the chat and to make it easy for me, if you could put it, uh, a queue in front of a question, uh, of course please feel free to make comments as well, but if you leave those without the queue, uh, then I think that uh, you know as much as everyone else and you aren't, don't have any questions to ask. So thank you Emily, looking forward. Thanks very much, Danny. Just so in case people don't know where the chat function is, you need to click the ellipses that says more and then show chat. Um, I will be mostly looking at my slides where I can see the chat um, whilst I'm presenting. So, yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As I say, we've got plenty of people from around the world actually today joining us, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. I feel very honored that people want to tune in to listen to me. Um, as Danny said, is that today I'm going to be talking about reducing the attack surface with records management. Now this talk is going to be in two parts almost, but they do me um, meld together quite nicely. The first part is just talking about what records management is and isn't, and then also how you apply what I tell you to cybersecurity. Um, on slides, move on. There we go. Um, so, my name is Emily Overton. I am known on Twitter as RM Girl UK. I am a self-employed under my own company, so I'm actually Records Management Girl Limited. Um, I was on the IRMS Executive Committee, which for anyone who's outside of the UK um, is basically the Information and Records Management Society. It's a membership organization for information and records management people. And it's not just records management, it's anything in the information world. And they have lots of benefits for just, just under 100 pounds a year, which is great. Um, I've been an author for various records management guidance. It's been a while since I've done some recently. I think it's more since I've been self-employed that I haven't. Um, I am actually going to university. I'm really sorry, Danny, but I am at the University of Dundee. That's mostly because Manchester doesn't do my course. Um, <laughs> and I've recently just finished my postgraduate diploma and I'm doing my dissertation research into gender fluidity and whether or not the binary uh, gender will actually continue within the UK public sector specifically. Um, I'm an ex-civil servant, ex-NHS, ex-county and city councils, please don't hold it against me. I think the only thing I've got there is that I haven't done HEFE and um, police, but we'll not talk about the police part. Um, I live and breathe records management, I'm nearly 15 years in. Um, I, <laughs> I actually um, got asked last, last year, I think it was, was what was my hobby? And I was like, um, records management. Um, I didn't actually have a hobby so I had to go and find some because apparently having records management as your hobby and as your job is pretty sad and so I've kind of come to the acceptance that I'm actually just a fundamentally a very sad person because I do it for fun as well as for work. Um, can anybody guess where I'm from? So this is where we can work out if people can use the chat function. Just give you a bit of a hint on the screen there. Can anyone find the chat function? Give them a few seconds. See if anyone responds. No, nope, not from Manchester, love. See, that looks like Manchester Cathedral. Does Manchester have a cathedral? Um, not York, no. It's not Durham, not Aberdeen, not Chester. I'll put you out your misery. I'm from Lincoln. Um, so that's Lincoln Cathedral. I think it's a fantastic place. I'm, I'm, I actually am from the place that is the um, home of the Red Arrows. I have a house at Rough Scampton until it moves to Rough Waddington. Um, 
so yes, that is my home city. People get very confused uh, where I'm actually from because my accent changes depending on who I'm talking to. So I'm feeling very northern right now because I've just been having a chat with Danny, um, whereas I'm actually based in London right now. So contrary to the fact that I'm actually going to university to study records management, um, you don't have to go to record, don't have to go to university to study it. I like to call it common sense, but apparently common sense isn't common. Um, and so we basically have to teach records management. I've been trying to make records management sexy for the last 15 years, and I've been told that I've got a very long way to go. So um, the thing that I do find, though, with records management is that a lot of people think it's a very nerdy topic, that I stand there with a clipboard and that I've got chains attached to my glasses, but I don't. Um, so this is what records management isn't. I have been mistaken for a musical producer before now. When they heard that I was into records management, people have actually said, oh, and, and then when I told them they were a lot less interested. Um, this is basically un, like records, full stop. The actual practice of records management is different. I can tell you now is that since I um, became a records manager 15 years ago, I haven't touched any kinds of records like filing myself. So that pile of filing right there, I used to be the filing girl. When I first started out, I was doing the filing. But when I started doing records management, I haven't touched filing since. What records management is though, is this. It's about digital, it's about electronic, it's about disposition, it's about systems, accountability, you know, na you name it. Personal data does fall into this, but it's not just personal data. We're looking at um, information that is um, of interest historically, um, where it has uh, val historical value for the future. Um, but also we're looking at legal cases that aren't solely about the person. There's lots of things that it's covered. Basically, if I take your computer and your notebooks and your filing cabinets away from you, you can't do your job. It is fundamentally something that goes through the entire organization. This is what records management is though. What we're looking at is everybody does records management. It's the present, it's the past. It's not a monster. It keeps the monsters away, if anything. Records management is the hand rather than the monster itself. Um, it's about saving money, not just saving money. It's about tactics and the way that you do stuff, the way you process information. And believe it or not, filing systems can actually be beautiful. <laughs> Trust me, they can. Um, and as it says in the top left there, it's about finding the truth and making sure it's not about lies. It's about emails, it's about fi personal files, that physical files that are on your desk, it's about your drive, everything, your, your servers, all the information, the backups and everything, that is records management. It's fundamentally the governance of how you deal with information coming into the business, going around the business, leaving the business and so on. Um, and it's making sure that you have integrity, so you make sure you cover your bases of the what, the why, the how, the when. Um, what is actually missing on there is the who. Um, you've also got on there, on that pictures there, you've got about legal files, um, and it's about having files when you desperately need them. Also, looking at things like theory, I took this picture, it's a copyright for James Lappin. Um, he's a fantastic artist in records management, which is really interesting. He does all of his um, presentations by drawing them. Um, but the concept that you should be routinely deleting stuff um, and out of your email accounts, but also putting business correspondence into record systems and then having record retention rules on your record systems. Nothing should ever be kept forever. I absolutely hate the word permanent because permanent for me means a thousand years plus. Um, and that means even after an organization potentially has closed, is that you're suggesting that they should be kept forever more. So having an appropriate retention schedule that doesn't have the P word on it is great. My abbreviation list, 
one of the things that I um, absolutely love is taking what other people know and turning it around into records management. So GDPR, good documented practice with records um, and Data Protection Act, disposition please annually. Um, all too often we get stuck with storage of records because nobody's got time to review things and get rid of stuff. We're all too keen about getting business in the door, but when it comes to actually getting stuff out the door, it doesn't happen. Now, for those that are in the public sector, the more you have, the more you have to give under FOI um, through transparency. So if you haven't got it, you can't give it. And if you have a retention schedule that got rid of it appropriately, great. Now, I'm not suggesting any kind of malpractice in this because I truly believe in transparency. Um, but records management is there to help keep things moving, which is why we have a Section 46 Code of Practice under FOI. Fundamentally, though, records management is knowing what you have, where you have it, and how long you need to keep it. Um, and when you look at it, being compliant with things like GDPR, you need to know what you've got so that you can protect it appropriately and that applies to information security as well where you have it again is it in the cloud is it on your servers is it physical and how long you need to keep it you've got your storage limitation and making sure that your attack surface isn't too big and like i said just a little bit ago it is records management is the golden thread throughout an organization and it's about having a single narrative and making sure that you have one version of the truth, that everybody knows what they have to keep and why, and so on and so forth. I drew this image. Um, my mum was very proud. Um, then someone designed it for me. I've recently just added in the archives claw right there. But this is just basically an infographic um, that shows you the life cycle of records management. Now, if you want to talk into things like the records management continuum, then I'm more than happy to do after this chat, but you ain't gonna sell that to anybody in your senior management team. Continuing what is basically what you get back. So you need to sell it in colorful ways that mean something to organization. So your creation is right at the beginning. So people look at it from a GDPR point of view of uh, privacy by design. What I look at from a records management point of view is integrity, um, availability and the third one's just escaped me accountability um, to make sure that we've got the right information in order to proceed because you want to make sure that whilst you're applying privacy by design and that you're creating stuff is that it's going to defend you or keep you in line um, when you're actually doing whatever it is that you're providing now, the conveyor belt can go backwards, so you can take stuff out of storage and put it back into use. Why recreate the wheel? Um, and you can also take things from review if you decide you want to keep it longer because you have business new needs or use to put it back into storage, then you can do. But what you should imagine here is that records sit on a conveyor belt for different periods of time. So just imagine a whole row at Tesco's has boxes on them. Some are traveling at... Um, one year a second. <laughs> Other people are traveling at one centimeter on the, on the uh, conveyor belt per 100 years. So you have different speeds of which the um, conveyor belts are going at. Um, now, where you have the archive claw versus the bin is because disposal slash disposition means to leave your organization. You are no longer the owner of it. So it may tip into the bin, into recycling or confidential waste, or it may be captured for archives, a little bit like the Toy Story claw, the chosen one, out of Toy, <laughs> out of toy Story where the aliens are being picked from the machine. Um, that's what I imagine the archives claw to be. So when you're creating correctly, who's creating it? Who's processing it? Is it being fairly and lawfully gathered? And do you have explicit consent? Now, I hate the word a, a consent, I really do, but it's um, because there are other processing conditions that you can use long before you get to consent. Um, but also is that if you have to use consent, do you have records of that consent? So there's an element of records management runs along 
information security and data protection without people realizing what they're doing. Um, in use, you need to know whilst it's in use, it's being kept up to date and accurate. Um, who's accessing it? Are the right people seeing, seeing it? Is there accountability, accessibility and integrity? Um, where is it stored? Is it in your offsite storage? Have you got terms and conditions um, that have been updated? Um, is there a process for how long records are in storage and if they're in storage for how long? Um, reviewing it, all records need to be reviewed before disposal because you could end up destroying something too soon. And as I say, disposition is either going to archive or into a bin. Now, when we talk about um, early disposal, there's a well-known case that people should be aware of. The Bichard Inquiry looked into the deaths of Holly and Jessica Chapman, sorry, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, um, at the hands of Ian Huntley. Ian Huntley was known to um, Humberside police via the name Ian Huntley and also Nixon. And um, he was able to get a job at, in Cambridgeshire um, at a school, which is where he got access to the, to the girls. Now, the Bichard report severely criticized the chief constable of Humberside police, David Westwood, for ordering the destruction of criminal records of child abusers, though they supported um, by the Humberside Police Authority, he was suspended by the Home Secretary, David Blunkett, using powers granted under the Police Reform Act. And the reason for this is because when he authorised the destruction in Humberside, they didn't know the difference between destruction, weeding and reviewing. So the records were sent for reviewing, um, but were actually destroyed long before they should have been. So when it comes down to um, Cambridge are looking for any back history of Ian Huntley, not only did they not sh share information between police forces, so there is an information sharing issue there anyway, um, but the records didn't exist. So this hit the papers thinking it was information sharing that was the problem, but actually the root cause of this was records management, because even if information sharing had been there, then the records wouldn't have been there anyways. And it's almost like if you destroy something too early, it's almost like you never had anything at all. And it's here where the issue went wrong. Um, the Bichard Inquiry report referenced confusion in police records management so serious that it was not even a common understanding of what was meant by weeding, reviewing and deletion. Weeding is getting rid of information that is rot, redundant, obsolete and transient and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, it can't actually be ascertained how many records were lost without a proper review. Um, so there's an interesting case there is that unfortunately Ian Huntley was able to get away. Now I'm not saying that had records management been um, in place at Humberside then this wouldn't have happened but I am saying it would go a long way to um, it not happening. And that's the same in, in most people's businesses. And the thing is, and this is my most scariest slide that I've done to date, is that it's happening all over the place. Records management is not being taken in, um, as, as, I don't know, serious as, it, as they should do. Because if you imagine, if you look into each and every single one of these that is on here, and by all means, please do afterwards, um, you have the San Francisco pipeline uh, explosion that happened. Um, and that was very much like the Aaron Brockovich uh, movie. I highly recommend watching that for what she does with records. And you also look at the justice for the 96, is that the kinds of records that were amended. In the back there, you have um, Harold Shipman. He was caught through metadata. He was amending metadata after the person had actually passed away. Um, we, yeah, so news of the world, for example, hacking, phone hackings, there's records missing, like the Fenevel email that went missing. If that was around, then it would have been a lot more simpler, but it wasn't. People were deleting their activity. Same goes for Jimmy Savile. I had to cover over his smile because it's really, really creepy. I'm really struggling with the eyes as well. I tell you what, guys, if you ever Google pictures of Jimmy Savile, brace yourself. Um, because it's not pretty. Um, but yeah, covering up his picture just there, purely down to um, where were the records 
in relation to Jimmy Savile visiting various places, they were intimidated by him being such a big celebrity and a star, but records management should still have remained. And lastly, um, you have the singer Ralph, Ralph? I can only just think of his songs, the Australian. Um, <laughs> um, he basically said that he wasn't somewhere when he was, and the record was a, t a videotape. Harris, thank you, uh, Ralph Harris. Um, he said that he wasn't doing something that he should have, uh, that he was, yeah, let's get my words in order and put my teeth back in, why not? He said he wasn't somewhere, and he was because there was a video, a record of him being uh, in the background, and that's what actually caught him out on his lying. Um, other ongoing uh, inquiries that are happening right now, you have the infected blood inquiry and you have the in independent inquiry into child sex abuse. Um, and we shall basically wait for the uh, results of that. So when it comes to data protection, and I appreciate guys that you're here for cybersecurity, don't worry, we're coming on to that. The thing that I always just kind of keep trying to stress is that the stuff that people are using in data protection is also records management. Having a record of all of your assets and your data, where it flows data, information that's going through the organization, that is records management. A record, simply, of your processing activities, that is records management. Policies, procedures, and processes, having a policy in place, having a process in place. Do you see what I'm go where I'm going here is that everything here requires a record or a list or a plan and getting rid of stuff in order to do data protection. And this is the same for cybersecurity and reducing the attack surface with records management. So how? So I'm just going to go over a bit of basics because I'm not sure how, what people, what my audience is here right now. But in the simplest ter terms, the attack surface is the sum total of resources exposed to exploit within your enterprise. Defending the attack surface was a lot less complicated when defined corporate perimeter existed, neatly separating a company's assets from the outside world. But next-gen technologies, e.g., um, cloud computing and software defined networking have dissolved the perimeter causing the attack surface to grow exponentially so the internet of things is a good example of how window of opportunity for cyber criminals has been blown wide open any device connected to the internet can now be a target of a cyber attack in this era of complexity infrastructures and sophisticated malware we must stay laser focused on reducing the attack surface to limit the opportunities available to cyber criminals and this ways of doing it. And it's through records management. So eliminate the complexity. Try and get all of your records into one particular area. If you've got storage of records in various different places and you don't know where it is, then you need to get on top of that. One of the most impactful ways to reduce the attack surface is just getting rid of it. Um, and the thing is, is that networks can creep over time. Complexity is often the result of poor policy management, i.e. records management, or incomplete information, rule creation, which can lead to policy mistakes, duplicates or redundant rules, uh, unused rules that have become stagnant and no longer serve a valid purpose, over, overly permissive rule definitions that allow access well beyond, what, well beyond what is necessary to meet business needs, unnecessary complexity elevates the possibility of human error and risk, and underscoring the, imp underscoring the importance of simplicity in a security infrastructure and policy management. So if you're using your records management appropriately and you know where everything is, why it's there and how long you need to keep it, as I said, the very fundamentals of records management, you are going to eliminate the complexity within your systems and software for your organization and thus reducing the attack surface. So if you've only got to look at one place of storage and you don't have to worry about the other 70 million places that people are storing OneDrive, SharePoint, Drives, um, Cloud, um, various different software um, as a service, all those kind of different places, if you don't have as many of those, then you don't need to worry about it. You, don't have, you have more money in your budget to spend on one sole place than having to worry about all the various different places. Now, you may already, this may already be too late for some organizations. 
but I say it's never too late to improve. Let's get hold of what we have. Even if you can't reduce it, at least know where everything is. Um, I've had files that even IT couldn't see because people have complex commit permissions that only one person can see stuff. Um, everything on your network needs protecting. So another part of that is visualizing your vulnerabilities. If you know what information has risk to it and how important it is, you can create um, a real-time model of what could happen in the context of network movement. Um, and it can provide the missing context. So there's three methods that can actually greatly assist, um, greatly assist with this. So the attack surface modeling, creating a real world model of the attack surface. So draw it out, see where it is. And look at where your prime targets for cyber criminals are. Um, network topologies, which demonstrate the potential paths to vulnerable assets. Um, and policies which dictate who should have access to and what. That is records management, is who, if you know what you've got and why you've got it, who needs access to it really in the grand scheme of things. Um, if people could just give me a bit of a, a feedback in the chat, just to, if this is making sense to everyone. This feels really strange. I feel like I'm on a radio. Um, if this is understanding to everyone, am I on the, on the mark here? Fab. Yeah, it's making sense here. It's going right. It's great. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, a third one is controlling your endpoints. So the first step to reducing the impact of endpoints on the attack surface is gaining visibility into what is happening on them. Independent process monitors keeping all end endpoints under constant surveillance and provide alerts when endpoint behaviors deviate from the norm. So an example of that is if somebody is accessing stuff from home or on the move, you need to know where your records are and could potentially be compromised through the new ways of working. Um, and where your endpoints and people are accessing stuff, should they be able to access secret stuff or top secret stuff or confidential information on the move? As you're aware, people have been caught out many, many times of having conversations on their phone, on the train. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to sack this person and so on and so forth. And you just think, why? Why are you doing that? You need to stop people having access to stuff so they can't have that conversation. If they can have that conversation, um, it's in fairness, it's stupidity as well. But if you can remove the background source information where they don't have access to discuss it or make notes on that particular thing because they can't get into it when on the move or on a wi-fi access yes you're going to upset a lot of people oh i can't do my work because it's on the train but at the end of the day what is more important the security and privacy of your information or the fact that someone can't do something bad on a train question so what you can look at doing is segmenting your network you may have perimeters around your network to protect the whole system, but segmenting your network still make whole, uh, makes whole sense as it helps to reduce the attack surface by increasing the number of barriers an attacker encounters when attempting to travel through the network. Um, so what we're looking at doing here is um, if you want to segment your network so that there's extra security around really important records, but of course you need to know what records they are in order to be able to segment it. And doing things like analytics. Um, so prioritizing analytics, security configuration assessments, traffic flow analysis, and quantitative, quantitative risk source. Uh, I can't even talk to say these words today, man. I should really just like, just take my teeth out again and just try. Um, <laughs> security configuration assessments, really long words. Traffic flow analysis and quantitative risk scores are three common methods of analysis that can be extremely effective in reducing the attack surface and they're methods you're likely to already use within your organization. And lastly, building new perimeters, whilst we cannot change the incentives and the resourcing that give rise to cyber attacks, we can limit the opportunities available to cyber criminals following the five steps that I've talked about today. 
um, and keep the bad, side, bad, bad guys on the outside. So for the most part, that's your kind of the wordy stuff around your networks that I wanted to talk about. But there are other things that you can do that are records management that apply to reducing the attack surface. Because at the end of the day, reducing is meaning deleting. So you need senior management buy-in to records management. You need commitment from the top when things go wrong, such as cyber attacks. The senior management need to know that they were told about it. If they don't know what's going on with their organization, then there's something seriously wrong. You also need risk escalation. So as I spoke about just, re just now on that last slide, is that records management needs to not only be brought into the entire structure of everything you do, um, but include risks of what could happen to your information. All too often, there is an information risk register that is separate to um, the overall register. No. It should be on your main risk register. Your information is the most important thing. You cannot do your job without that information. If you have a records manager, not all of them look like me. I'm very bright and sparkly. I wear 50s dresses and look just a bit odd. Um, most of the records managers don't look like me. Um, so get to know who your records manager is within your organization, someone with an information governance role that can help you trim down your records. By the way, I know a really good consultant, uh, if you need one. <laughs> Friendship with IT. Not every information security person is actually in IT, but if you're not already in IT, make friends. The reporting tools they have to help with reducing the attack surface is really going to help. They can pull reports for you that say when things were last accessed, and then you can compare things against the retention periods. You can look at... Um, how often things are accessed and where they're accessed from. So many reports can be drawn down from your systems, um, but also ask any people like your software as a service if they're able to give you access to reporting if you haven't already. There's plenty of people around your organization that want to make a difference. They've seen things go wrong and usually they're the ones that are tidying it up afterwards. So adopt those people, take those people under your, under your wing and teach them about information security and records management and how we can reduce the amounts of files that people uh, are going to have. Not forgetting having an information and records management policy, utilize that policy with reducing what records are on your system. If it shouldn't be on your system, get rid of them. Stop, stop spending your budget uh, and your lots of money securing someone else's wedding photos or music files. And I know these are on people's systems. It's the same for in off-site storage. I find Christmas decorations all the time in a box. I found empty boxes in storage. So you'll have files on your system that are um, em empty. It's just a file that's there, super top secret file, nothing in it. Um, trim all that down. Get rid of it because that way you don't have to protect it. Having an up-to-date retention schedule. When you start deleting content or asking people to delete, make sure it's in line with the retention schedule that's been signed off by senior management. Because if senior management have signed it off, the book stops with them. If it comes to a court situation and you don't have the records, they're going to be asking you why. Well, you sign this off in such and such committee. For the physical security folks, seek out where all your records are, data flow, how it ends up in the basements and know who you people are in property. People in property will know when uh, leases on buildings are ending um, and pretty much records work like a cat. If, it's, if it fits, it sits. So um, finding information where it is, it could be in the attic, it could be in the basement. Check those places before the building is handed over. Even if it's not yourself, me telling you who will tell someone else may save a data breach. Um, and that's pretty much the tools that I have. The other thing I have to say is that reducing the attack surface of big data is a huge problem. So big data are sets of data set, <laughs> big data are data sets whose volume is too large. The data set streams in at an unmatched speed and must be dealt with in a timely manner. Big data technology is next big thing to records management. Big data projects either struggle with meeting records ma management requirements or ignore them altogether. 
Um, my surprise comes from the, the fact that not only is records management a compliance practice, but it's also one that can literally pay for itself. Big data was coined by NASA as a term to describe data sets too large to analyze. It's, it has since become a way of describing the problem of cost effectively managing a large amount of data regularly found in today's financial and mining companies. And here the data size is growing enormously, not only due to a natural increase in business growth, but it's also through the adoption of social media and through the supporting the big data analytics. So where does records management come in? Too often records managers are seen as the company, company librarians hidden away or as a compliance roadblock telling you what you can't do. What is not appreciated is that records managers have been fighting the storage battle for a lot longer than IT. Be it physical or digital storage, the desire has always been the same. Store what is needed, store what is only needed, and keep it available and keep it cheaper. Then came the storage revolution. Seemingly over the storage in your common PC was the same as the RAID server you were running as a document cache. cache. And we moved from the talking about gigabytes to petabytes, probably even zettabytes. I don't even know what's bigger than zettabytes now, if anybody in the chat knows. Um, and I've seen the question, Ray, and I'll come, come to it shortly. Um, today, however, data usage has grown to such extreme levels that companies are being forced to focus on storage. Even with the move to flash storage and lower, lowering costs, it promises that there's still realization that growth in data production is growing well in excess of the decrease in storage costs and to the big data problem. In trying to gain competitive advantage through enticing new customers or reducing operational costs, companies have been building data marts, data warehouses, data lakes. To achieve this, big data systems are built and the data is sourced from client systems and here, herein lays the heart of the problem. Copies of data are expensive, become unmanaged and in some cases become copies of um, and are new records that become unmanaged. The solution is by no means easy, especially if you're already well down the big data path. The first step is realizing that you do not have to reinvent records management to solve this issue. Borrowing from the techniques of the past, we find appropriation for the concept of, of archiving as opposed to offloading or backing up can be a savior. When matched with a clear meta model that allows tracking the source of the truth for data across the life cycle, it will allow for synchronization as well as drive discovery across the client systems, archives, and analytic platforms. Sure, there will be, um, sure there will be new patterns applied, as is always the case with new and more capable technology, but records managers have been doing this for a while and may just surprisingly surprise you with how quickly they can adapt. Recently, I got a notification from Have I Been Pwned? And within hours, I got an email. The most exciting part about this is that um, they're telling me about, we are aware of all your little and big secrets. They have no idea how boring and sad I am. Um, we saw and recorded your doings on porn websites. Your tastes are, are so weird, you know. I'm glad he thinks that because basically it's that I have a webcam cover. Um, so whatever he recorded, it must have been really interesting. Um, <laughs> you did terrible things with your body. <laughs> um, I found that hilarious because basically he's got access to my LinkedIn if it's LinkedIn that's done the breach and likely it's not because I don't use my professional email on any other social media sites. Um, the thing that I say about this is that when people are receiving this in this is that it's a data breach of information and records. Should that database that was breached being within your perimeters of a single set, would it have actually ended up on, on the, um, the Elasticsearch server? Probably not. If you were looking after um, the, the stuff in the first place, would this have ever happened? Had your records management, securing the records, managing the records, everything here, the information in information security is records. I talked about rot earlier, getting rid of the rot in your systems. 
redundant, obsolete and transient information, free up your budget by getting rid of stuff that is duplicate, excessive, no longer required, short term, etc. Rot is not on your retention schedule. It's in effect getting rid of the leaves out of a drain so that the water flows faster, the water being the information, or getting the hair out of the bottom of your sink for those that live with women. Um, it's like this, I've pictured in the apple. First, th th first thing when you get information, it could be this bright, shiny, yeah, we need this data, this is really important. But actually, as time goes on, it rots away and it eventually becomes the last apple. So at that point, long before it gets to that point, you should be looking at getting rid of it. If anybody would like to learn more about sort of record keeping in an information culture, um, this is a book recommendation for you. Jeffrey Yeo is, is a fantastic author. Um, and yeah, basically is that um, I think it's a really useful book for anybody. Uh, you don't have to be a records manager to read it. The other thing is I'm really the worst person to go to the cinema with. I can find a records management or information records management problem in pretty much any film you take me to see. Um, and I won't be quiet about it. So just looking at the films, I've tried to get a film for everybody that's interested. Um, most recently, the Joker one, I nearly punched my mate when it came down to uh, talking about the data breach and he didn't appreciate it because it's a fantastic film and I was applying records management to it. Sorry, not sorry. So yeah, I'm not gonna read all those out, but as you can see, I'm hoping that you'll see that records management is a lot more important within your organization than people have really paid attention to so far. And we're coming to the end. I just wanted to talk about not everybody looks like me. Um, other records managers aren't as loud and abrasive as me. I'm a very much a Marmite person. I am very aware of that. But try and see if you've got somebody who's interested in records management if you haven't got anyone at all and pay attention to records management. And therefore, we come to the end with any questions. Danny, if you wanted to field questions for me, please. Are you on mute, Danny? Yes, thank you. you yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't. Really, <laughs> that was that was awful. I'd lost control. I didn't have control of my own microphone. I need, I need to say, <laughs> bad as uh, I don't have control of my own vertebrae at the moment. So, uh, so the, 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 any any whinges are not nothing to do with Emily's brilliant um, seminar there, um, but just the fact that I've actually put my back up, uh, back out actually. So yeah, so uh, you can see. Yeah, there's a, a couple of uh, well, first question that's come in actually. Uh, first one came in from Ray, and it was uh, something I was sort of wondering about: how to convince co-workers uh, that there's no value in hoarding past information. Um, I, sort of, I know from experience you can go policy, 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 um, but people often think, well, just in case, and I'm looking between my own filing cabinet and the shredder here thinking that the two ought to meet. Mm. Um, so that's a really good question because one of the things that I look at is um, how to sell records management, and it can be anything from um, reducing the amount of clicks that they have to do. Um, you, you basically, you have to put your mind in the mind of them so they look at how they see things is that oh really long searching times i never get anything back that i want uh, when i'm searching for it it takes me hours to find such and such oh my back hurts because i've been looking through the filing cabinet too long all those grumbles that you hear keep your ear to the ground and utilize all those complaints and turn them around into something good so um but also you need to get senior management buy-in to the policy to say, yes, you will have an hour to be able to sort it out. Because one of the things that people say is that I haven't got time to delete stuff. Well, actually that time that you take to delete it will save you time further down the line. But also looking at creating a new filing structure that is easy to find and is very short. You tend to find in a lot of organizations that they are folders that are 25 layers deep. It's like an onion trying to get to the middle. So if people can intuitively look into their systems and go, yep, I know where it is, I found it, and they can start working on it straight away, um, that is a benefit. So yeah, looking at all of the grumbles and complaints that you hear from staff 
um, and the pressure that they're under and turning it into good stuff for them. Hopefully that helps Ray. Cool, yeah, it's made me feel very guilty now about complaining about my back just when you talk, start talking about people uh, rummaging through, spending too long rummaging through filing cabinets. It's, it's true though, Danny, is that, is that obviously you're not a filing cabinet injury, um, but you do have so many health and safety issues trying to find the right person who can go down into the basement and look through the filing cabinets. Um, nobody wants to do it, and it's usually a bit of a lottery. It's like whoever steps back at the last um who wants to do it um and obviously you put you can cause more sick leave if they've hurt the back through trying to shift boxes out the way and stuff like that and um you also have uh, issues with vdu and people staring at the screen too long trying to find the documents that they need and so on and so forth Great, thanks. Uh, can I just add, uh, just to make everything clear, that the fact that Emily knows that my back injury is um, not due to a filing cabinet has a completely innocent explanation. Uh, but we'll go back to the questions. <laughs> um, yeah, um, from, from Connor here. Unmanaged data represents significant risk to organisations, but getting senior management to buy into data governance records management, uh, given the cost, is very difficult. What's the best business case? Um, so I actually got an A in university for my business case. I was really impressed with myself. It's basically one of the things that you have to look at is aligning records management with the record with, with the organization's aims and objectives. So if you can align yourself with where the organization wants to be in three, five, six, ten years time, um, you're more likely to get interest from the senior management based on cost. So try and look at stuff for, all, for the future but also provide a return on investment. So if you say is that if we do this, it will take 500 man hours to sort out, but in the future, it will save 500,000 hours. Compa make things realistic and comparable, but also be able to show the return on investment for the future. Um, you need to use the organization's aims and objectives and where they're going so that you're running alongside them, not running away from them or trying to push against what they're wanting to do. So you can usually easily find the objectives on the website. It's that great structure plan or whatever that people are trying to do. They, they, they want to be the, the best, first, best customer service ever. Well, to provide best customer service, you need to have appropriate records. And to do this, you need to do this, this, and this. And it does mean that you have to pull the roots up of the organization and they have to be prepared for it. Another thing that you can do is use, and I don't like scaremongering. Scaremongering is the worst thing. Um, but you do have the option of comparing yourself against other organizations that have gone through, the, through hell. So as I said earlier, and I showed you that scary slide, um, look at all sorts of cases that are in the news and saying, well, we're just like them and we've got exactly the same problem. So let's prepare ourselves to not have, have that happen to us. And it's about telling them is that it doesn't matter who you are, um, you will always be taken down. So thinking, looking at Talk Talk, it was taken down twice by the same teenager and because he was bored. So it's not even malicious attack or sophisticated there. It's literally just someone that's bored. Um, and I'm not surprised if this hasn't increased during the pandemic because there's a lot of bored teen teenagers around. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. It's something that people have been uh, discussing where people were, you know, in terms of uh, where some of the, uh, the attacks might come from and uh, what people are actually doing. Um, I know I, I for, for one parent, uh, made the decision to take the time limits off the children's computers. Not, not the actual co um, content filters, but at least the, uh, the, uh, the, the, time, the time limits. Screen time. Yeah, mind you, mind you, yeah, um, mind you. The other, children to children. I just want to say one extra thing on that is that uh, although this isn't a sales pitch, it literally is just a tip, is that I do teach people in a records management course how to do business cases for records management and how to make it important. Um, so it's always worthwhile um, having a training course on records management just to get that kind of stuff involved. Um, it's very difficult for me to, to explain it in person without actually showing you the stuff. Um, so yeah, I do do training courses on how to get records management buy-in from senior management. That's useful. Um, can, can you touch on the difference between information sharing and data sharing, please? Uh, uh, um, Linda's asked that. Mm. 
Um, it's one of the same thing. But, uh, Linda, could you please give me a bit more information about what you mean? Okay, well, if, if Linda's got anything else to add to that, uh, perhaps maybe you just go on to the next question. Uh, should we expect yeah. records managers to work closely with complex data architectures? You should expect your records managers to work closely with everybody who has anything to do with information and data. So yes, basically, we should expect the records manager, in fact, the records manager becomes one of the riskiest people in your organization that they too get put on the risk register because they know so much about your systems and information. So um, in terms of your architecture, your infrastructure, your business classification, your everything. Um, um, so yes, is that um, you should actually be getting a records manager involved in pretty much everything. And the thing is, is that when you say, well, how are they gonna do everything? That's where you need a records management team because this isn't an easy thing for one person to do by themselves. Fantastic. Um, just, yeah, uh, just, uh, <laughs> no, it's not a human doing it. It's literally, it's my, it's my setup because I'm, uh, for those that don't realize I'm actually partially deaf. And so I purposefully put subtitles on so that, um, people who are just like me can actually listen. Um, uh, personal bugbear of mine, um, and just while anybody's thinking of any other questions, uh, should we try to stop everyone trying to manage the world by email? And do we need to? I mean, is, is records management the solution we've been looking to? Uh, th th this, is, it was, this was kind of came from various attacks on UK Parliament and people getting into MPs' emails um, and them sharing passwords. And for me, it wasn't the fact that they were sharing passwords. It was so much critical business of the country being done by email that worried me. Um, a lot of the attacks on email around those kind of people is because they were actually attacking home inboxes um, and the people like that are trying to, to steer themselves around the FOI by using personal stuff, not knowing that actually their personal inbox still applies regardless if they're acting in the faith of a public sector servant or civil servant then they should be applying. So some of those attacks that happened on the personal inboxes shouldn't have been there anyways. Because that's the thing is, is that presenting the, the surface attack and reducing the surface attack is ensuring that people aren't using personal devices that you can't control. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, am, I imagine over the last two or three months uh, that attack surface has got, uh, has, has probably mushroomed and I suppose now the, uh, the trick is going to be how, how, how do we get it all back under control? Uh, if we had any control to start with, but maybe this will be the, uh, the realisation that perhaps where everybody thought it was, uh, it never has been. As a self-employed person, I've been terrified that I'm either going to be out of a job or too busy and I can't work out which one it's going to be. Um, <laughs> so, uh, something comfortable. I would like that. That would be great. That would be nice. Um, anybody, um, just a quick look at the, uh, nobody else is coming up with any questions at the moment. Uh, so, uh, I don't know whether you have no any worries. closing points you want, you'd like to make Emily. I think I've made them. I've really gone through everything that I need to say is that, yeah, is, is that, Find me on Twitter at rmgirluk. Um, I'm always free to help with stuff. Um, yeah, is that if you found this useful, you could always buy me a coffee, as it says on the screen. Um, otherwise, yeah. Thanks very much, Ray. I appreciate it. This has been recorded, actually, and so hopefully we'll be able to share it for people that haven't watched. That's great. Well, it uh, just remains to me to firstly thank Emily for uh, you know, really covering something that no matter how much you might try and deny that it touches you, uh, you know, the very fact that we're standing in front of you know, the kind of devices, uh, not to mention we've probably got, oh, I don't know how much legacy paper uh, for stuff that we just thought might be useful mm -hmm. one day, a bit like my drawer of electrical cables, um, that uh, it really does apply uh, at so many different levels. Uh, and maybe if we can get some good personal habits in place, uh, that might grow into our organizations and we can all be- You can even do it at home, Danny. Is that it doesn't have to apply to work, reduce your own attack surface at home. Yep, Check yep. out where all of your email inboxes are. I'll, I'll tell you an embarrassing story about that one offline and I'll leave everyone else to imagine, uh, imagine what it might be. 
But uh, <laughs> so it now just remains for me to uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to, uh, to well to present this today, uh, and also for answering the questions uh, and for allowing us to record it. So it'll be a it'll be a resource. It'll be a new set of records uh, which we have to manage and make sure yep, that indeed and up to date. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, for all the comments, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.